So hi guys, welcome along to today's video. Thanks for joining us, hope you're all keeping well. Uh, today we're going to take this freshly powder coated Pro Kart chassis and turn it into a fully rebuilt go-kart. That should look something like this. So first up, here we have the freshly powder coated chassis. First job is to install the central fuel tank. And here we've just got a threaded bolt with a couple of nuts to try and spread these two legs out as the fuel tanks can be quite tight to squeeze in there. So we've wound that in just to separate the legs slightly. And there's the new fuel tank with a bit of lubrication on there. You've got to remember kids, you can never have enough lubrication. With enough lubrication, and if it's travelling fast enough, anything will fit inside anything. So you see a bit of a squeeze there, but once you've got them legs spread out far enough, it should pop straight in. Now the tank's in, we just need to remove the spreader bolt and move on to the next job. So next up is to install the seat. Now this seat, when I took the car apart, I took it and I left the brackets, the seat retaining brackets on there. So fortunately put it back together, it's a fairly straightforward job. It's just a case of lining the brackets back up on the chassis, fitting the bottom half of the clamps, and then going around evenly tightening all the bolts up until the seat's nice and secure. If you was fitting a new seat into this, it would be a different process entirely. You would take the actual seat off of the brackets, leave the brackets on the chassis, and then go from there. Again, making sure we're tightening all the bolts up evenly to pull them nice and square. And there we can see the finished clamps holding the seat brackets onto the chassis. Now we're going to fit this carbon Kevlar floor tray with the chassis protectors on. These are the bolts used with the Allen, countersunk Allen bolts, which have a rubber washer between the floor tray and the chassis. So the chassis protectors bolt onto the floor tray and then the whole setup bolts on. You can see there the washer, the rubber washer between the floor tray and the chassis. And there you can see the rubber washer too. Finished floor tray is on. Next up we have the caster camber kits. So on the far left we have the top plate. In the middle is the base plate for the top. And on the right hand side are the lower plates for the lower half of the chassis. So we're going to install the lower halves first whilst it's upright. And we need to ensure the little central dot that's punched on the bottom of that is facing forwards. This is going to help us to set our caster angle later on. Quite important, that's in the right orientation. Next up is the axle to go in. So the axle bearing carriers for this particular chassis are split carriers, so you can just take the top halves off and remove the axle easier. It's important to keep them as a matched set doesn't really matter where they come out of, but as long as you keep the bottom and, the bottom and top halves together. So we're going to start by installing the lower halves of the bearing brackets. Now everything on this car is installed with these Nordlock washers. These are a special locking washer that is serrated on both sides and when they're new glued together in the middle. And they're an unbelievable fixing that will, that will stop anything coming undone. It's, the, by far the best locking fixing that I've ever used. So these are fitted all over this car to stop things vibrating loose as they take quite a battering. You can see here I've also installed the disc protector, the rubber, the plastic block just under that central bar, just three bolts and one of the engine stops on the right hand side. So 
So they're just nipped up gently to start with. And now we can install the axle. Now again, this axle was, was not completely rebuilt from fresh. It already had the bearings and the disc mounted on it. So the disc, if you was putting a brand new axle in this, we'd have to measure it out to get it centered on the, on the chassis. Install the bearings and install the disc once you have the caliper set up on there. Fortunately for us, this is the same axle going back in that's already been set up, so it's just a case of dropping it into the bearing housings. I'm going to install the keyway there and just slide the sprockets and sprocket carriers over them in case we need to pull the axle back out. Here we can see there's the keyway for the rear hub and the keyway for the left hand side sprocket. Just tapping them in, sliding the sprocket carrier over it to make sure it fits before actually installing the axle. You have to be careful with some of these sprocket carriers, some of them have different size keyways so it's important to get the right one in there. Now we can see the bearings are nicely centered in the lower carriers. And it's all sitting nice and flat within the chassis. This is also the point where you would be changing your ride height or your wheelbase length depending on which holes you selected for the lower bearing carriers to be bolted into. So now the top of the bearing caps are going on. Like we've mentioned before, always keep them as a match pair. And just install the bolts and nipping these top bearing cups up loosely to begin with. Nice and evenly again across the axle. So whilst we're nipping these bearing cups up, it's nice to spin the axles and make sure it's nice and settled and centered in there. And once we're happy, the top caps are nipped down. We can go along and nip up the lower bearing carriers. Now the outer ones are tight on these. The center ones are nipped up and not too tight to allow the axle a little bit of leeway with the flexibility across, but still having that center support. important to torque these bearing caps up. They're an aluminium housing, so people often over tighten them. They're quite a low torque setting. Again, evenly torquing them up will pull the bearing cap down nice and square. So now we need to install the grub screws which hold the axle bearings and collars to stop the axle from sliding through the bearings. So now we've got the axle in the right position, equally at the side, we can install these grub screws. I so say this is a previously installed axle, so we actually have the grub screw and locking collar holes already in there where the axle's been drilled before. So we need to line it up and install the grub screws. If this was a brand spanking new axle going in, you would be measuring the distance from each side to make sure the axle was centered before installing your grub screws. And the locking ring on the inside just stops the axle moving if it is hit from the side. Once all the grub screws are in, and all the axle collars and the axle bearings, give it a nice spin to make sure it's still free, and we're done. 
you know, we've just popped an engine on the side, not to align the chain or bolt the engine properly just yet. We're just getting a rough alignment for the rear sprocket to nip the to nip the pinch bolt up and make sure we've got the keyway roughly in the right place. You can also see we've popped a cable tie around the keyway and the axle bearing and locking ring grub screws just in case they work loose it stops them from falling out. We don't want to lock tight these as it will make it a nuisance to come back out so just the cable tie around the outside helps with that. Now we're going to set the rear track width. We measure off of the bearing carrier and we're going to set these to 152 millimeters from the face of the bearing carrier to the face of the rear hub. So we've slid it out to 152. Once we're happy with the setting, make sure it's all square, we can nip the pinch bolts up. Again, the same on the other side, making sure it's equal both sides. This side we have to go through the sprocket carrier. I have made another separate video on the setup of this Pro Car. So if you're interested in learning about track width and setup changes you can make, check that video out. I'll pop a link in the description below. Now we're going to install the brake. Now when I took this off, I left the master cylinder, brake hose and caliper and the carrier all as one complete kit. So this is a simple job of just reinstalling the master cylinder onto its bracket with two bolts. And now for the rear caliper. So this is a Kelgate floating caliper, which means it bolts over the bearings that are fitted to the rear axle, either side of the disc. This is a split carrier to allow you to unbolt it and allow you to remove the axle easier. And the idea of this is that it flexes as the axle flexes going around corners, so you don't get the brake disc binding up on the pads and the caliper as the axles flexing which you could possibly get with a fixed caliper to the chassis. Again tightening the bolts up nice and evenly, pulling them bearing caps down nice and square. Now you can see the caliper actually rotates on those bearings and the rod just needs to be fitted into the back of the chassis. It's important to try and keep this link rod at a 90 degree angle to the axle. That's to make sure the force going through the link rod is mainly a compression force and not a bending force. It's a bit of a balancing act between how far up right you want the caliper as well because you want an ease of access to change the pads. You can also see here the bracket that is welded onto the chassis from factory to for the standard factory caliper. Not used in this install as we're using this floating Kelgate GTK. Now we've got the caliper installed, we can see the full setup with the bracket and the adjustable link rod that bolts onto the chassis. Important tea time, always keep yourself hydrated. Time to install the pads. These simply drop in with retaining pins, a small retaining clip and then a centre pin just to stop anything falling out in the worst of any events.
you can see now we're just going to pump the pedal up, pump the master drop, move the pads into the disc, otherwise we'll probably forget to do that before we take it out on track. And that's the brake caliper installed. Now this is a little technique I like to use to tidy up brake lines and fuel pipes and things like that. A little piece of fuel pipe, cable tie through, around your fix in and back through and then you can slide it up to whatever you're attaching it to. This just helps to keep the brake line, fuel line, whatever it is you're attaching off of the chassis and any metal components that might eventually rub through and wear through the lines. I do think that this helps to make it look neat and tidy as well. So we complete the whole brake line with that kind of install. Now we're going to install the brake pedal. We've got adjustable holes front and rear for this depending on the height of the driver if you want a longer or shorter pedal. And it's important when you're nipping these up, do them up. But don't completely do them up solid. You can see if you completely tighten it up, the pedal itself becomes very, very stiff and you won't be able to move it. So you need to nip it up and just back it off slightly, not so there's no free play side to side, but the pedal still swings forward and backwards with no resistance. Now we just need to attach the link rod which goes to the master cylinder and the safety cable underneath. You can see here you've got three positions of wherever you want to attach this to. This will give you a different feel on the brake pedal, a different uh, fulcrum point for it to act on the master cylinder, so more or less travel. Unfortunately the camera battery died here so I didn't capture this but it's quite simply a link rod attached and you can see on the pedal itself the adjustable screw at the bottom which is a, a stop to stop the actual mass cylinder pushing back on its reservoir cap. Now this is time for the accelerator pedal. This is the before shot the accelerator pedal. You can see it's dirty and has worn out anti-slip on there. So as with every single component on this rebuild, it's so important to clean and inspect every component. So not only is it a cleaning job, you are looking over it thoroughly and checking for any cracks, wear, fatigue, welds broken, anything like that. That is the purpose of cleaning it, not just to make it look shiny, but to fully inspect it. So we're going to take all the old anti-slip off, we're going to give this a good clean up, a good inspection, renew the anti-slip, which is exactly what we've previously done to the other pedal for the brake, and all the other components that have already been fitted and will get fitted on the car. Well, some drivers don't like this anti-slip, you can have just the plain pedal. I prefer it as it feels like I have more contact with the pedal itself and more control. And there we have it, finished pedal ready to be installed.
Now to install this throttle pedal, first of all we've got to install this little throttle stop here. Uh, now it's worth noting all of these bolts have been tapped out, ready to accept all of these new nuts and bolts going back together. So the pedal is going to be installed in the same position as the brake pedal, in the one furthest away from the driver's seat. If you had a shorter driver, you'd be installing it in the hole that's closest to the driver's seat. And the other adjustment screw on the front of the throttle pedal is to align it straight with the opposite pedal, so both your feet are at the same position. Important again when you're nipping this up not to overdo it and to allow yourself that movement in the pedal. Here you can see how the pedals are aligned nice and straight. This is just a small little skid plate which goes in the front of the chassis just to help when you're riding over the curbs. Time for the lower front bumper to go on. Here we can see the old hand hammers employed. Very, very useful tool. The good thing about the hand hammer is it's soft enough not to damage the material that you're hitting it with. It simply has a bolt either side just to retain it in position. Now it's time for the upper bumper, which like the floor tray has a countersunk washer on the outside, with a countersunk bolt and a rubber washer on the opposite side where it mounts through to the chassis. Fit these in first and then just stretch the top bumper over into the holes. Now this device is a, a safety device to stop the bumpers separating should the retaining clips for the nose cone come off. This will only allow a certain amount of movement up and down to stop the bumper flying completely up and still be in there protect you in an incident or accident should the worst occur. These are the bumper clips, hold the bumper down to each other, which sandwich the nose cone brackets and hold the nose cone on. And that's the front end pretty much complete. All that's left to do is install the return springs to the throttle and brake pedals onto the top bumper bar and the front end is done. We're installing the roll bar, the torsion bar on this particular chassis which is simply a tube that goes on with clamps either side. Again unfortunately the battery on the camera ran out at this point. And this is the throttle cable bracket which simply bolts through the chassis and houses the throttle cables. That's it for today then guys, end of part one. 
Uh, hopefully you can join us for part two where we'll finish off putting it together, put the engines on, get it started. Um, I've got to leave it for today. Dog face is waiting to go out. She's looking quite impatient. So yeah, I better get her around the fields. Take care guys. Hello dog face. Oh. Hello dog face. Huh? Ruff. Ruff. Ah.